On behalf of Nursing Now Challenge and the Sabin Vaccine Institute, I would like to welcome you to the session, Nurse and Midwife Voices to Lead for Global Vaccine Equity and Acceptance. We are thrilled today to welcome the seven nurses and midwives who were the winners of our Nursing Now Global Solutions Initiative Challenge for utilising our own stories as nurses and midwives to advocate for immunisation in our communities and the policies that we need to ensure nurses and other health workers are at the forefront of COVID-19 vaccine rollout and routine immunisation programmes around the world have the safety and support that they need to deliver. Today's session is all about the power of our own stories to lead, to inspire and to motivate our collective action. I cannot wait to hear from our challenge winners from Iraq, Lesotho, Malawi, Nigeria, Sudan, Uganda and the United States. To get this session started, I'm turning it over to Vince Blazer, Director of the Immunisation Advocates Programme at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, who will moderate the session for the nurses. And we're absolutely thrilled that Professor Sheila Clow, former co-chair of the Nursing Now campaign and former Health Minister of Botswana, will give us some closing reflections on the stories that you will hear from us today. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I wanna join Lisa and Nursing Now Challenge in welcoming you to this session. Now, obviously I'm not Vince Blazer, but I will be stepping in for him today. My name is Francesca Montalto. I am the proud daughter of a nurse and more officially, I'm the associate for the Vaccine Acceptance and Demand Program at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. I'll be filling in for Vince today as he deals with the family medical emergency. Now at the center of any medical emergency or health setting are nurses. Nurses and midwives are the heart and soul of medical care and help their communities navigate health decisions, thereby enabling a happier and healthier world. Nurses and midwives have an enormous power, all too often underutilized, to influence policy and global collective action. As we've seen, the recent applause for nurses, midwives, and health workers has not resulted in enough policy action to prioritize them during this pandemic but we are seeing nurses instead step up to use the power of their voices and stories to impact change. In late September at the Global COVID-19 Summit hosted by the United States, Kenyan nurse Zipporah Origue spoke alongside presidents and prime ministers telling them that nurses are at the crossroads in our families and communities. We are in the hospitals. We are trained to be advocates and drivers of change in our communities but we need your support to put us in those positions. With COVID-19 vaccine inequities persisting, including inequities among health workers and vaccine acceptance issues, a major concern for our communities and among health workers themselves, nurses and midwives stories and leadership are vital to ending this pandemic in the coming year. So our nurses are here today to tell their stories. And as they do, we want to hear yours. Engage with us in our ICN portal and on Twitter using the hashtag ICN Congress and hashtag vaccines work to tell us your stories about what is happening in your community with COVID-19 vaccine rollout or routine immunizations. Tell your stories and impact change. Our first story today is from Mpo Shedile. Mpo is a registered nurse and midwife and a lecturer in the Department of Nursing at the National University of Lesotho. On that cold winter day, I sat outside basking in the sun, wondering why people were coming in and out of our house in that fashion. After some lengthy time of cluelessness, our grandmother called us in the house and told us that we have lost our father and we will not see him again. Though I couldn't comprehend what she was saying, I joined my brothers in the loud cry that they had launched. We cried until we were tired and no tears were coming from our eyes. Had he known, he could have taken his flu vaccine as advised. My father was on several occasions advised to take a flu vaccine, but he refused. This was not his first episode. 
but he never knew he wasn't going to survive it. Secondary to this loss, I was raised by a single mother. Me and my two brothers found it very difficult to make ends meet. I went to school on barefoot with no lunchbox, no money to buy lunch. My mother struggled to buy me school books and proper uniforms. But because as young as I was, I felt there's a need for someone who will change the mindset of people like my father towards flu vaccine. I persevered, completed school despite all the hassles. Growing up, I was an altar server. And one of the mandate given to altar servers is to do voluntary community service. I visited the sick neighbor with the same mandate. I assisted him with feeding and he tolerated feeds well. This surprised his children because they said they struggled to feed him. But with me, feeding wasn't a challenge. Whenever he refused feeding, they would call me and I would successfully feed him. Indeed, I turned things around for them. The old man recovered and continued to provide for his family. This made me realize that I have a calling, caring for the sick, bringing change and hope. Since I wanted to be a change agent, and because of this discovery of self, I decided to join the nursing profession. Nurses promote health, prevent illness, and above all, we are change agent colleagues. When Pam Hibbs, as the newly appointed nurse minister, arrived at Hagney Hospital in East London, she did not find it in the best condition. There was shortage of skilled staff, the equipment was outdated, and the buildings were shabby. Her immediate response was to have the wall swept, scrapped, and the linen changed to get rid of the stale smell that pervaded. She made an effort and she managed to turn things around. Colleagues, apart from being change agents, we are a voice to lead, a vision for future healthcare. COVID-19 has left our day-to-day -day lives and the global economy dilapidated like the Hegney Hospital. This pandemic has affected our people who are either sick or being killed due to the spread of this disease. WHO, as of the 15th of October, 2021, had 239,437,517,000 confirmed cases and 4,879,235 confirmed deaths globally. And among those, we had our colleagues, Linda Parkinson, Josephine Peter, Kim Cotello, and Diana Law. As nurses, we signed up to take care of patients and none of us signed up to die. We are getting sick, our physicians are getting sick, and we are not getting this virus from the hospital. We are getting the virus from the communities. Going out into the communities is scarier than going into everyday work because we do not know who has it. We are in this virtual conference because of fearing to contract or spread the COVID-19. Like Pam colleagues, we can turn things around. While she simply cleaned the walls, we at least have an ammunition against this monster, we have the COVID-19 vaccine. Our community members may not have COVID-19 now. They may have had it and survived, but like my father, they do not know if they will survive the next episode. I urge you all attending this conference in support of my initiative to promote and increase COVID-19 vaccine uptake in Lesotho to please like and comment, I am interested. On my Facebook COVID-19 vaccine post, and in that, 
you'll be agreeing to join the blend Zoom meeting where we will together explore ways to make this stream a reality. Invite friends to join this snowball until it, get, it gets as big as the universe. Together, we can reduce COVID-19. I am Shedile Mpo on Facebook. Go and like, and of course, comment. I am joining. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mpo. And, you know, we appreciate, everyone in the world appreciates you choosing to be a change agent and a vision for the future of healthcare. Um, now our next speaker, we're moving to Malawi. Uh, Rashid Manyanda is a registered nurse and a nursing officer at the Ministry of Health at Falombe District Hospital, a district coordinator for maternal and child health programming, and the co-founder of the Center for Elderly Support. Rashid, whenever you're ready. We all have different stories with common values. My journey started in 2004 when my father got ill. Imagine a bedridden father who was spending his sickness hours in his bedroom, calling for his nine years old boy, who was not even sure what his isolation meant and tells him, you need to take care of your mother and, and sisters. It never made sense to a nine year old lad who could not even understand what his illness meant. This was certainly meant to be a goodbye. Next thing I remember seeing my mother panicking, jumps out of my father's bedroom in Harry, just to send me and my sisters to our neighbor's house. This was a changing moment of my life. We started experiencing financial hardships barely a month after his demise as my mother was only a housewife. A year later, it was shocking seeing my father's relatives chasing us out of our own house, claiming ownership of my late father's property. We had no choice but to move out to my grandmother's home village and squeeze into her small saving gas such house. I was that poor boy crying each and every day, missing television, good food, going to, to school by car, you name it. One day, I remember my friends laughing at me on top of their voices, saying, hey, rich boy, get used to this life. You'll never get back whatever you had. My mother rescued me from this humiliation by chasing away these losers friends. She then put me on her lap and tells me, if you want to get back your life, work is hard in school. She always wanted me to be a doctor to save lives of people like my father. I started doing hard in school because I had no any other options but school, considering the challenges that I was facing. In 2012, I applied for medicine at the University of Malawi, but I was redirected to a nursing school at the same university. Nursing was never my calling until my second year of study when I cared for Mama Maganga, a severely ill 36 year old woman with a colostomy and infected wound. When I was doing my clinical placement at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, Mama Maganga lost hope because of her condition. Few weeks later, she got better and was discharged from the hospital. And she was calling me each and every day, thanking me uh, for the care that I, uh, I rendered to her. She reminded me that I saved her life. I felt very good. It was from this moment when I started loving this profession like never before so that I can save some more Mama Magangas. It was from this background that motivated me to join the battle against COVID-19 pandemic when COVID-19 emerged. Everyone was afraid. I remember almost all the professionals being advised to work from home, apart from the resilient nurses and doctors, who could not leave hundreds of suffocating patients alone scattered on the floor because all the beds are full. I remember seeing some brave nurses from USA who composed songs and shared on different social media platforms only to give hope to the rest of the world. Some even posted video clips dancing wearing scrub suits in hospital settings. I thought of my passionate colleague Austin, a nurse at Palomba District Hospital, working in COVID-19 treatment centers seven days, 24 hours, then stop shift, then quarantine for 14 days, making it a total of 21 days without seeing his newly born baby. Nurses are always there for the world, regardless of the challenges at hand, such as taking care of COVID-19 patients without masks in some African countries. After hearing the news of COVID-19 vaccine, it was a relief to me and to my fellow nurses. With my colleagues, I decided to get vaccinated and join the campaign of motivating others to do the same. 
who knows? Perhaps if the vaccine had come earlier, they would have saved some dedicated and courageous UK nurses such as Nagred Wayne, Olansanyo Komina, Linda Bagson, and many others who put lives of patients before theirs, ending up dying of COVID-19. I cannot forget the death of my colleague at Palm Medical Hospital who died of COVID-19. Imagine seeing your colleague dying pain for his shortness of breath, saturating at 24 percent when he calls you by your name, asking, "Is there anything you can do at this far?" I was devastated, realizing that there was nothing we could do but watch him die. It was not long ago when many hospitals in India and Italy were full of COVID-19 patients who could barely match the number of nurses. We do not want the situation to get worse than that. All we want. We, if we want to resume to normal, we need to get vaccinated. I know we all have different personal preferences, but if you want to save lives, reduce congestion in hospitals, revamp your business, COVID-19 vaccine is our only option right now. Let's emulate the dedicated nurse Rose of Uganda, nurse Shagu of Iraq, and nurse Han of UK in promoting COVID-19 vaccine acceptance among healthcare workers. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? All I ask you to do is to get vaccinated for COVID-19 and motivate, motivate others to do the same. Share my story on your website or Facebook page with hashtag get vaccinated, heal the world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rashid, for you know telling your story and you're so right, nurses are always there. And again, thank you so much for being here today. and. Um, telling us your story. And hopefully, um, like Rashid said, uh, to all our viewers, please be sure to tweet on Twitter and share your stories with hashtag ICN Congress and hashtag vaccines work. Um, up next, we have Rafiet Akayokon. Um, Rafiet is a registered nurse and midwife in Nigeria. She is a public health nurse um, at Sobe Specialist Hospital in Kwara State. Uh, Rafiet, whenever you're ready. When I was in primary school, I had a best friend, Sarah. We were eight years old. She was fair and full of life. We would go to school together and pick up mangoes from the huge tree on our way to school. One day, Sarah and I set out to the mango tree when she fell while she was competing for the best racer. She sustained bruises and we decided to keep it private for the, pe for the fear of the pains that come with hydrogen peroxide and iodine, which our parents used on our wounds. D days later, my friend had a spike, refused to eat, and then convulsed. The local herbalist in our community came around and gave us some herbs with no effect. A few days later, while returning from school, I met Sarah's mom on our way to the community health center with tears in our eyes. She said to me, Sarah is really bad, and the doctor said she has tetanus. I immediately followed her to the hospital, and on getting there, my beautiful friend was already dead. At that point, I felt guilt for advising my friend to keep her wound. I felt really sad after realizing that my friend could have lived if she was immunized. I cried and refused food for days. Then one morning, while preparing me for school, my mom sat me on a lap, combed my hair, and gave me a peck. Then she told me I could be a hero for Sarah. Then I asked her how. She said, by preventing other young girls like Sarah from dying. She told me I could achieve that by being a nurse who would ensure that everyone makes a healthy life decision. At that moment, I felt hopeful that perhaps I could be a change maker and importantly, I could save lives since I wasn't able to save my friend. As a nurse, I have continued to offer hope to people and I have helped families make better health decisions. Every day, I would wear my uniform, greet my colleagues at work and smile wide as I meet my clients. Just like I do every day in June 2020, I found myself driving through a once busy, now quiet, lonely road to work. This was just one out of the many challenges that COVID-19 brought to the whole world. I was about resuming my shift when one of my colleagues, Gabriel, told me, I am not safe. We are all not safe. I just lost my uncle to COVID-19. And although I tested negative, but then I find it hard to sleep. Who knows who is next? And even with all of these as healthcare workers, we still remain the hope that people look forward to. I understood Gabriel better as I continued my shift when I saw Miriam, my coworker, 
functioning an endotracheal tube and making her clients comfortable, even with the stress and tension written all over her. We finished the shift exhausted, but we both know that still we have to show up as nurses in the next few days to resume our shift to care for people in full PPA, no matter how uncomfortable it might be. And yes, we did show up. I found Gabriel and Miriam and myself admitting new clients, reassuring families, functioning and cleaning and administering medication. And this just shows how nurses have showed up and provided hope against the lockdown and the movement restrictions, regardless of the fear we perceive around us. A few months later, the world felt a ray of hope as the news of the, COVID, of the discovery of COVID-19 vaccines made its way to media outlets globally. I found myself reading through the WHO newsletter sent to my mail. And for the first time in months, I could genuinely smile and believe that things could go back to normalcy. However, the acceptance of the vaccine has been impeded by misinformation, cultural perceptions and myths, especially in Africa. I, found, I find this challenge personal to me because I know how it feels to lose a loved one from a death that could be prevented by just taking jabs of vaccines. Perhaps if Sarah had taken the tetanus vaccine, she would be alive today. Again, I, as usual, I showed up in the intensive care unit of my workplace five months ago when a particular client we admitted started gasping for her. We did all we could, but then we lost since COVID-19. It was a 49-year-old man who left a wife who is a present a present trader and two innocent girls with huge, with huge hospital bills to settle. I thought of the hope for the mother taking care of three little girls in a low-income country like Nigeria. I could see the pains, the agony, loneliness, and insecurity written all over this poor human. Sadly, this is just one out of the many people who have lost their lives to COVID-19. We have all seen the cremated dead bodies in India, the mass burial in the US, the waiting sound of family members in Nigeria, and even as vaccines roll out, vaccine hesitancy remains a major challenge, especially in Africa. As healthcare professionals, we remain care core, core individuals helping people to remain healthy, and we should take the lead to achieve good health for all. Imagine if we all, as nurses, who have continuously given hope and care, lend our voice towards vaccine acceptance. Perhaps we would get many people to listen. I ask that we all utilize our most active social media pages and upload a one minute video or story about how we have personally been affected by this pandemic and include the impact of not getting the vaccine. This should be uploaded every Wednesday with the hashtag beat the virus by 7 to 8 p.m. You can also tag anyone you know to join you in this challenge. If you are in, you can show your acceptance by replying yes to my Facebook page, Akin Okun Rafiat. I feel excited seeing nurses and leaders who have come together from various parts of the world to share ideas in this Congress. And this has shown a sign of commitment and unity. If we all take this unique character we have portrayed into this challenge, I believe that we can make people listen. Let's make the whole world know that we are all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Rafiat, for sharing your story and for choosing to be a change maker and addressing vaccine acceptance to increase uh, vaccine uptake. It's such an important issue today, and we appreciate your impact. Um, up next, we have Rose Nakame. Rose holds a BSN and advanced nursing degree in MPH. She is the executive director of Rural Elites Mentorship Initiative East Africa in Uganda. I was born in the time when the world that brought Uganda's current president to power was concluding and grew up in one of the suburbs of Kampala, Uganda. Between the ages of six to seven years, as other children were using their weekends to check out which ice cream tested better in the different shops, I used to be with my mother hoping from one hospital to another to understand what was causing my frequent nose bleeds and fainting. And the lack of neurosurgery expertise and diagnostic equipment at that time made the hoping feel like a part-time job for my mother. Each visit meant that my dad had to find out where the hospital fees were going to come from. For me, it was waiting for when my hand could be held crossed from one street to the other to visit another place with my people with many people waiting to be seen. But for my dad, it was heightened worry, more so when the diagnosis of a benign brain tumor became confirmed and I had to undergo an operation on top of the other related treatments. I remember during 
during discharge that the neurosurgeon was saying that she might hardly see 18 years of age or have very low immunity. At around 13 years, my mother asked me what I wanted to do about this experience. This answer came from looking at the time God was borrowing me, to, was borrowing me and at, mo at moments where I could barely sit in an exam paper with a hemoglobin account, account of three grams per deciliter and yet get a and yet get an offer to one of our country's best schools. It is these outcomes that could arise and from trying to hold on in challenging times that continue to guide me to do the best I can, no matter how small, to reach the goal or act on a pressing challenge. It also reminds me of my rural nursing experience, working, working in, um, in low resource settings where I had to do incision and drainages when patients had waited for about a month with no sight of a doctor to dressing wounds of about 30 patients in an eight hour shift on top of routine nursing activities. Now we are amidst the COVID-19 pandemic whose gravity I felt immediately after our intense selection process, which involved all planes flying next to the roof. The noises in the ears with no internet connection and just after it was war planes of fear, uncertainty, lockdown and closure of public transport, which were even the health workers first. Then I remember when I learned about the COVID-19 vaccines throughout a WhatsApp message from a fellow health worker, sharing about how it was manufactured to finish off Africans and how we should not trust those who have funded it and their aim. This was occurring alongside the pondering media debates on how the vaccine targeting all age groups would be effectively be distributed among, amidst the myths and fears that vaccination is associated with. However, I felt like that time when I would sit in an exam and arrive to question whose answer I really knew after all. It's the young child clinic nurses and midwives who have manned these clinics delivering vaccines at stationary sites such as hospitals in, and in outreaches, crossing rivers, driving in penetrable and impassable roads to get to the populations. It's that resilience that is found in nurses and midwives. I got to know it's not limited to the education level and geographical location from stories shared on BBC, CNN, and my local media station, NBS, showing nurses and midwives' experiences during the pandemic, such as Wangu Susan, who's a Kenyan nurse working in Finland, who suffered from COVID-19, experienced post-trauma stress disorder, and still came back to serve in the hospital. Another, the Ugandan enrolled nurse, Okodia Doris, who wheeled the patient for miles when public transport was closed down during the lockdown, and from Army and American nurse at New York Presbyterian Hospital hospital turning up to online storytelling trainings in scrubs after a 13-hour shift and bearing with a terrible internet connection of colleagues yet remaining and fully participating throughout. It is similar to that experience of being on a busy shift with a terrible diarrhea and having to use the washroom now and then and you start asking yourself should I be stationed at the toilet door to hear what's going on and easily use the washrooms yet returning back to inside that canola catheter or care for that post-operative wound to the best of your ability. It's in that resilience that we should all look at nurses and midwives to understand what has worked. I mean, it's the common challenges of delivering vaccines to rural and hard to reach areas to get the COVID-19 vaccine to everyone, irrespective of their socioeconomic status or geographical location. That is how we shall win this war. Create the hard immunity, stop new variants, ensure safe travel and even enjoy the interconnectedness of our world through collaborative efforts and adventure. But we should know that if vaccine iniquity and hesitancy are still making headlines, we are far from this. To best paint this picture is Nurse Maureen Kaziro, who's a mental health in charge at Hoima Regional Referral Hospital, a mother to one-year-old baby Swan, who narrates of how her shift starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 9 p.m., with the exception of weekends, and often asked to help out at the immunization center, which is usually having one attending nurse each day to 200 clients. If this is the experience of COVID-19 immunization to those whom the health centers are accessible, then you'll probably imagine the 67% of Uganda's population living in rural or rural areas having to track to track miles to reach the vaccination centers amid its vaccine fears and myth. Stories such as those we collect at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which highlight issues such as the lack of mental health support for healthcare workers and low digital literacy, for which we collaborated with other partners such as Atlantic Institute to design responsive programs, which are so far 
estimated to benefit 30 healthcare workers of Poima Regional Referral Hospital in Uganda. We need to tell more stories. Utilize it as a medium to communicate what the challenges are to exercising our nightingale oath and deliver more patient or public centered healthcare with full caps. If you believe that our geographical locations, rural or urban, and our socioeconomic status, rich or poor, should not dictate our ease of accessibility of the COVID-19 vaccine, then I'm inviting you to join us on the 15th of November this year to, to attend a knowledge sharing Zoom meeting about our experience of using storytelling for strong and resilient health systems or directly contribute to my fundraising and my fundraiser. In fact, my birthday this year on 1st March, with extreme doubt, fear, I launched an online fundraiser with a plan to raise $1,000 to train 15 rural nurses and midwives in storytelling and disseminate them. We were able to raise about $1,000 from 17 donors. In this virtual room, there are over 100 participants. If of each of you joined us to donate $80 on Remy Africa's Giving Web Fundraiser, we could train 10 nurses and midwives on storytelling for vaccine equity and address the hesitancy challenges. This is about believing that leadership lies in the ability to be vulnerable. Through our individual stories, allow others to connect with our struggles, learn from them, and collectively contribute to strengthening a health system to save and promote healthier living, and can be best summarized by the words of Nelson Mandela. It's in the character of growth that we should learn from both pleasant and unpleasant experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, for sharing your story and for being an advocate for vaccine equity. Um, up next, we have Shagul Hassayan. Uh, Shagul is a nurse and master's student at University of Reparan in Iraq, and she holds a BSN. تمنم تنها سیازده سال بو لقنا خیلیان دی بوم با کم نخورج بو همیشه بدست آزاری کده و هنری اینالان با کم همیشه دچار سردانی دکتر بالام دکتر کن نه دتوانی نخورش یکی دز نشان بکن با کم تنها در منی دخورت نه دتوانی شوام خواهد آن کاریگری کن رنی درس کرد بو لستر من همیشه به تقد بوم اگریم چون کنم دتوانی هیچ تب کم با کم کرد نوی آزاری کی یعنی یار متیب دم بو باج بونا با کم پی اوتم کتم باج ابم به تقد من با بالام همیشه اترسان با کم لذت بدم لبیری خون ده دموت خوزگه گوره بو مایا یان دکتر بو مایا تا ازارکی چاره سر بکم هر اوکات بر یارم دا بب مکسی یان پیشه کل بجیرم که بتوانم ازاری با کم و خیزانه کم و دورو پشتکم دورو پشتکم کم بکم اوا یان بتوانم کم بکم او بوی بتوانم بنون لگل با کم کت مقصد کردن پیام موت که خندنم تاو کرد امید بتم بشه کی پزیش کی نه مید چی تر تو ازارت ها بد کمین گوره بو چون که من دلیه کمی نه خزانه کمم، با کم گریا، و تی تو با بریار دیا، و تو نامید من دل کنی تر با کن عزاری هبد، با کم پیوته م ابد ببی باوی اتود، با کم دای کم بون بهانده رو پاکش تو یارم تی درم باوی بتوانم بگم باوی که دمید، و بون با کسی کدام میست، با هو خزانه کمم، استش هنده ری کی زور زور گوری من لگشتن با پلی برستر لوی استه، و آن کس و آن کسایتی من یاد روز کرد، و کسی کی یارم یارم تی درم میره بان، لگل دور پشت کم. استاد با کم نخوشه بالام است ات وانم از درکی کم کم او یارم تیب دم چون که من پرستارم صادق لام او برد است اینکه با خندی ماست به اوی بتوانم زیارم زیادی یارم تی نخوشه خالق بدم کات کتاب کوتنم ابد لگل کانال گیا سایت یک لسر ایش خیر خوازی کنم راست خوب پیوندیم پیو کات پیم آلا شنازی پیو کم که خوانی تو پرستار کن یارم تی نخوشه بته من کن این وق اندامی کی خزان کنی خوان هموکار و الله من این و هر کاتک پیستیم پیام بد وق پدانی زنیاری انجام دانی کار بون و خرکر نی پروسه چاق بنا و خوش وسیع کار کن من با اوی بتوانی سرکو تو ببین ببینه هندر یک بون خوش کن چون که معمولی تو انجام نخوش دخوش وسیع کار کت و درست آبد چون که پیش پرستاری وق پیش کنی کنیا پیستی با خوش وسیع نه هز بیاری ها با انجام دانی کار کنی اگر کار کت خوش نه نتوانی هیچ کار انجام بدهی با هیچ کسی یکی گل خالانی لامن گرینگا خورش نی کار کرد تا هر آواز وای کرد دوست که تو بوم لپیش کم دا همیشه کار با آوا اکم همو پرستاره پیش کی خویل خوش ویست و گرینگ بین و شادی نه خوش کن وقت اندامی خزانه کنی خمان من که تک چاره سری نه خوش اکمو ماملاین لگل اکمو پارتی گل دلم یان بشه گل جیانی خم چون که ماملا قصه خوش بشه کلا چاره سر و ار متی نه خوش عاد بوزو چاق بونه و برس کرد نوی وری نه خوش بلا کرد نوی زنیاری بون استانیم پرستارو کو پیشیه کی جهانی گرین پیشیه کی سر بخو سر 
سربخو و تاکری ب نه تاکری پزیشک و باز کردی اکو ما فوگرینگی پرستار نه کنتی کرتی تندروستیو نه خوشخانه کنده چون کتا استگرینگی با پرستار نه دعای نه یکی تایبتو جلوبر یکی تایبتی نیله ولاتا کم ده ولی همان کد اکو ما فکی زور لسر شانی پرستاره بی اوی هست به من دوبونی بکرد لگل اوج در رزیلی نه گیرد لعنت دکتر استافی نه خوشخانه کنده و و گرانت نوی گرانت نوی رز با پرستار یا رخصان دنی جنگی کی لب با رز گرتنی پرستار و کسایتی و پیشی کی گرند ناوند تندروستی کنده. اما جد رجای انجام دانی ورکشوبی کی روبرو لشونی کی گنده. پرستار کردن یعنی دعوی یار متی ل پرستار استافی نخوش خانه کن کارمند استافی داره پزیش کن. وزارتی تندروستی کس بالا دست کنی نو وزارت و اوی بتوانی گران کاری کی جورا درس بین لبواری تندروستی دعوی بر پشتونی ولاد تو سیستمی تندروستی لولات کنده. Thank you. Thank you, Shagul, for uh, for being here today and again for sharing your story. Thank you. I'm over the moon <laughs> to be here with you. Yeah, we're thrilled to have each and every one of you here. All your stories are absolutely inspiring and powerful. Um, and you. up next, we have our sixth uh, presenter, Mohammed Abdul Karim Adam Modbear. Um, he is a registered emergency response nurse at Medical and Health Services University Hospital in Sudan. I was born in Umdurman in 1996. Then, when I was 13 years old, my little brother got sick. He was suffering from fever, severe vomiting and convulsion. Father, mother and I went to the hospital. When we reached hospital, the doctor examined my brother. And after that, we, we want to talk to him. He wanted to talk to his team using a medical terminology. And he said, we can't do anything at our hospital. And your brother needs a pediatric ICU bed. And we don't have it. He wrote a brief note on a paper and gave it to us to seek a hospital with BICU bed. We went out from hospital, father handling my little brother on one hand and a piece of preparal paper on the other hand, trying to find another hospital, draw a taxi. We went from home hospital to hospital till we reach a hospital and we are in the ER. I just it's standing at the head of my brother while father talked to, talk to the doctor. I tried to talk to my brother. He didn't respond to me. I touched his hand and it's called. There is no movement. I shouted to mother to come. Doctors comes out and did their examination and said, and said it to us. Your brother is dead. I cried a lot during that time. Then a couple of questions comes to my mind. What if we have the nearest hospital with full facilities. What if we have a good referral system that my brother could use, could use it and survive till we have a PICU bed? What if we have a family member at health at healthcare team that he could guide us and will help a lot? For me, it was a turning point. I just keep thinking about it from that time till high school examination. And I decided to enter the medical field. I studied hard, I get a good score that enables me to got an admission to the Faculty of Nursing Sciences at University of Khartoum in 2014, and I was happy to help my family and community. Six years later, when I was studying hard to pass my final examination year to be officially a nurse, a sudden unexpected global pandemic occurred, which was a COVID-19 pandemic that disrupts the normal way of life. People lost their lives, and there's a panic and fear at all events, and all facilities are locked down. In the middle of the pandemic, the situation becomes worse, and people need help. I decided to help. I work as a triac nurse, as a triac nurse. At that time, I wasn't graduated yet. During that time, I watched several patients die, and watched families lose their loved ones. Children become orphans, and mothers become widows. Then COVID-19 vaccine rolled out, and a group of nurses from different continents come together and meet up virtually for a six week of training, sharing many values, including humanity and solidarity. Despite many challenges we are facing to do that, watching Amy joining a session after long working hours, listen to Shagel doing, dealing with her home exams, hospital works, and do her best to attend the session. Meanwhile, listening to the Rafiat story, all these things keep us motivated to work toward our common shared goals, which is enhancing vaccine, accept vaccine acceptance among our local communities. We are a group of nurses agreed upon target goals to be achieved. What if all nurses acted toward common, toward a common goals? Imagine a hundred of nurses across the world debated their effort to raise awareness on vaccine acceptance. How our impact would be for those who didn't take their vaccination yet. I encourage everyone watching, watching this call to reach to the nearest vaccination center and get vaccinated. I call on everyone to take a photo and share their vaccination card 
under the hashtag vaccine safe lives. Also, I would encourage everyone to commit to convince five people from the community to take the vaccine. If you agree to participate in this challenge, please type yes in the chat and let's use our hashtag. And let's use our hashtag. I encourage everyone, I encourage everyone else to take a lead and act toward vaccine acceptance. We are the closest one in the community. We are the trusted one. So let's act to save our community. Together we make an important because together we make an impact and save millions of lives. Uh, Mohammed, thank you so much for telling people, you know, get vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, please go get the vaccine to save lives. Um, and for now, for this uh, presentation and session, we're moving on to our last speaker, um, Amy Staley. She is a registered orthopedic vascular nurse uh, at New York Presbyterian Hospital and Weill Cornell Medical Center in the United States. Uh, Amy, take it away. Thank you so much, Francesca. It is March, 1998. My father lays in bed preparing to endure an unfathomable battle with cancer. He is a warrior, a fighter, and my mom is a lover, so she tucks him in with a warm blanket. She closes the door and tells me to count the red and black speckled ladybugs crawling across the doorknob. I notice his favorite book, Into Thin Air, a book about a group brave enough to climb Mount Everest. Some make it to the top, some run out of oxygen along the way, but I'm five years old and can't read, so I continue to count the ladybugs. One, two, three, and he's gone. My mother hugs me. I feel safe and secure, and she is not a nurse, but she is a healer and a giver, and it is because of her selflessness and sacrifice over the next 13 years of my life that I make the choice to become a nurse. I get into nursing school and pick up a job working with pregnant teens in foster care. They don't have mothers or homes, and many hold extensive criminal records, but they do have Miss Amy, and Miss Amy is both a lover and a fighter, and she speaks to them like they are the next world leaders because she knows that they are. She teaches them how to dress and speak respectfully, make resumes, and land jobs. They were by my side the day that I received my dream nursing job at the number one hospital in New York. I looked at one of the girls and said, when a door looks closed, all you have to do is knock. She told me that she was going to be a nurse too, and today she is. I began working at New York Presbyterian where the sun shines every single day and miracles multiply by the minute. I am a proud nurse, not an Olympic gold medalist or an executive member of anything, but I am faster than Usain Bolt when crisis hits and the CEO of tucking you in with a warm blanket when the chaos has subsided. It is March 13th, 2020, and I am writing my name and the date on a brown paper bag to store my N95 mask. What I thought was a virus is turning out to be a war, and I leave my shift and walk to the hotel where I'm staying, but this time I'm not counting ladybugs. I'm counting refrigerator trucks. Two, four, six, I close my eyes and imagine that I'm at the top of Mount Everest. I open my eyes and see the bare streets of my city, wondering if we have enough oxygen in this country for a city of 8.5 million people. Then the silence breaks. It's 7 p.m. and the streets of New York are empty, but so loud, singing songs of hope and gratitude. People here across the Hudson River, across the world, are gathered on balconies, screaming from windows and rooftops, and applause for frontline workers. We all came together to fight. Where were you? Finishing up a 12-hour battle of your own, working from home, or perhaps waiting in line behind 68 people just for toiletries. When the COVID-19 vaccine arrived, I was overwhelmed with hope, expecting songs of humanity, but instead I saw division. Many have forgotten that we are still battling a war with this virus. When we are floated to the COVID units in the United States, it is not called floating, but rather deployment. I will never forget when our first COVID vaccines arrived on Christmas Eve, seeing the hope in my colleagues' eyes as I had the privilege of vaccinating the same nurses who I watched care for those who you and I love so dearly, witnessed trauma and heartbreak over and over again, take only 8, 10, 12 seconds to breathe before resiliently grabbing that brown paper bag and walking into the next room to say, Hello, my name is Amy, and I am so glad to be your nurse tonight. I know that hospital walls across the world cannot speak, but if they could, they would tell you that the time to act is now. 
I have spent the past month in a virtual room with five other nurses across the world discussing ways to increase vaccine equity and adherence. Not six feet apart, but rather worlds apart, we have discovered our most powerful weapons, our voices. I call on each of you here today to speak up. If you have already received the vaccine, I ask that you visit my website, frontlinefriends.org, to see how you can join me in painting a clear picture to both my city and yours about the difference that we can make. If you have yet to receive your vaccination, I urgently ask that you go out and get it now. It's not about an injection, but rather caring for the humanity of one another. Start in your communities and remember that if a door looks closed, all you have to do is knock. Let us spark hope before we return to silence. It's 7 p.m. and I hope that you hear my voice counting down the moments until we join together. Unity begins in three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And honestly, I'm over here getting emotional just listening to all of your stories. Um, we really here at Sabin and the Nursing Now Challenge we appreciate um, all seven of you nurses and midwives for taking the time and having the strength to tell your stories and for choosing to be agents of change. You inspire me and I hope you've inspired others to share their stories to impact change. I will now pass the virtual microphone to Professor Sheila Tsao uh, for closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much colleagues and everybody who's listening out there. Allow me to start by thanking those who are sometimes left out. Firstly, our sponsors. I take it one of them is the Sabine Vaccine Institute. I want to thank our organizers for this session. And especially my own colleague, Professor Lisa, who I know is one of the real ambassadors of the Nursing Now Challenge. And lastly, I want to thank you, the presenters, the very great leaders who have been able to share with us their stories. It has been very inspiring to me as one of the advocates of the people's vaccine uh, worldwide. I have been able to present for the people's vaccine to be able to say we need a vaccine that is available to everyone, everywhere, leaving no one behind. Now, let me, as an advocate, really say that um, the stories have inspired all of us, and I'm hoping that out there, we are going to do everything in our power to work with our communities and to ensure that they access the information that is needed, that they get rid of the misinformation, and that they access those vaccines. And also we need to work with everyone, with our communities on the gender aspects. From the stories that have been shared, we have all been able to realize that the people who passed away after refusing to be vaccinated have actually been male. We happen to live in societies where being sick is not masculine. So indeed, as vaccines become available, we are seeing that our men are the ones who left behind. And as a result, they get to succumb to the illness a whole lot faster than everyone else. So I'm hoping that we can do a lot in terms of that because our communities cannot be without our main folk. Let's be aware that health starts at, commu at community and family level. Hospitals are for repairs. So, but one of the things that the COVID pandemic has shown us is how interrelated we are as human beings. We are branches of the same tree and we are indeed leaves of the same branch. No country is safe until all countries are safe. Indeed, no community is safe until all communities are safe. It is therefore still a shame that we are seeing in a lot of our countries in Asia, our countries have reached only 5% vaccine uh, equity, uh, vaccine coverage. Yet in a lot of the Western countries, it's over 70% and some of them are even vaccinating adolescents. 
so that that vaccine apartheid is something that we as nurses and midwives should be able to, to fight. Why? Because our communities are hurting. The death toll is taking its toll on nurses and on midwives. The very people who are showing us that they are a formidable force that can take care of everyone in all settings. The very people who are dealing with misinformation and ensuring that we have vaccine equity and acceptance. So indeed, we still have a long way to go, but it is us as part of the nursing challenge to be able to do that. So let me simply say that um, our health is also a political choice. As nurses and midwives, it behoves us to make sure that our political leaders have that data that can enable them to make great decisions. That data that can enable them to be advocates as leaders to ensure that the vaccine misinformation is taken care of and we have vaccine equity and acceptance in all our countries. That is something that only you and I can do. So we need nurses who can be those kinds of leaders. So to you, our nurses and midwives out there, I want to say to you, go forth and spread that message because in the ultimate, it is universal health coverage that we are well known for. And it is with universal health coverage that will bring us to a world where everyone is equal, has equal access to health, and where everyone has vaccine equity and acceptance and that is the only way we will rid our world of COVID-19 pandemic, as well as any other pandemics that are coming to threaten the world in which we live. With that, I thank you very much for this session. And I thank you for participating passively as well as actively in the session. I thank you. Thank you very much.